Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'd like to now uh, introduce our first speaker, it was um, Raj Jena, who's actually a, a consultant clinical oncologist from Edinburgh's hospital down the road. Raj has worked for us for a number of years, I think uh, almost five years, probably four years, four years um, with our machine learning team in the area of medical imaging, and that's really applying uh, machine learning techniques to medical images to uh, uh, you know, di do diagnostics, for example, on medical images. It's really fascinating work, and he, this morning he will tell us more about um, what this is about. Thank you, Raj. Okay. Thanks, Scarlett. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today and to meet some of you uh, yesterday, yesterday evening at the dinner. And having a look at the posters, I can see there's a real diverse range of subjects that you're doing. Uh, some of you have posters that are very much related to some of the things I'm going to talk about. Uh, and others are doing very innovative things, but, but completely different, in a completely different area. I'm going to talk to the lowest common denominator and not assume any prior knowledge. And really, the purpose of my talk today is, I suppose, as Scarlett mentioned, I'm a collaborator and a consumer of some of the technologies that have been generated by Microsoft Research. And I think I'm aware that when you do a PhD, you become intensely focused in your area of interest. And sometimes it's it's uh, not so easy to actually see where things are going to go, where the end application is going to be. So what I'm going to tell you today is a story all about the end of the journey, how some of these things can actually have an impact in terms of improving outcomes for patients. So first of all, just get over the boring stuff. I have to acknowledge all of the people that give me money. <laughs> And uh, having done that, just to go through what we're going to talk about today. So I'm talking about computational imaging, and that means different things to different people. So I'm going to define how I'm going to use the term for the, for, for the next few minutes, and then talk about glioblastoma, which is the particular condition that uh, uh, is my main interest clinically, and talking about imaging and how we use imaging in glioblastoma. And then to tell you a story, a serendipitous story as it happens, about a new imaging technique that I came across about 12 years ago, uh, and how we actually looked at taking that imaging technique and applying it to something completely new, completely different from what it had been designed, uh, and my experience of actually trying to do that. And then I'm going to move slightly from using that as an exemplar to thinking about more generally about the kind of ways in which we might use imaging in slightly more imaginative ways to help with patient treatment and thinking about patient treatment. And then I'm going to kind of, you know, look into my crystal ball and think about what lies ahead and ways in which the work that you do might be able to help us uh, in the clinic. So the first thing is, what do I mean by computational imaging? Well, every time we actually generate any kind of digital image from, you know, the picture that you take on your camera to an MRI scanner that we have in the hospital, we are, of course, doing some level of compute in order to actually generate the image and display it on some form of uh, screen. But what I mean by computational imaging is where you take that original image and you do some kind of additional processing, some additional mathematics, in order to get extra information out of, the, out of the image beyond what we actually see in terms of the actual pixels on the screen. And often, that means that you have some kind of underlying model for what you think you're seeing in that image. And you, you, you use the data that's coming from your imager or your scanner to inform that model. And I'm a very be strong believer in the fact that you can use models to encode understanding of a particular process that's going on. And in biology, that's very helpful. So this might look like a normal MRI scan of a patient that's got a brain tumor. Actually, it's a model. It's, it's a model of our understanding of the patient's brain tumor. Because if I said to you, well, let's look at this area here where the edge of the tumor and the way that it spreads into the normal brain is rather indistinct. That actually forms the basis of a model. I mean, what we, we have an understanding that we can see this tumor because when we give an injection of something to the patient, it gets taken up by the tumor, and that's what causes the signal to appear. And we know... I just wonder whether you've got the point on Oh, yeah, that. so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and we know that, um, roughly speaking, the edge of where we can see the tumor 
there are about 5,000 tumor cells in every millimeter or every voxel on this actual image. So already we have a kind of conceptual model of what it is, what biological process actually allows us to see this image. Sometimes the models we use are quite sophisticated, and this is a model where we're looking at blood flow in different parts of the brain. Um, this one's actually been used in a patient that you can see there's a big area here of the brain that's not, being, uh, not receiving a blood supply because the patient's actually had rather a large stroke. And again, we have an underlying uh, biomechanical model for understanding what happens if we inject something into the patient's bloodstream that shows up on a scanner and gradually it moves all around your circulation um, and goes to all of the different parts of the body and then eventually your kidneys start getting rid of it and it gets actually eliminated from the circulation. So we can build that uh, into a, what we call a, a vascular and arterial model that actually allows us to interpret an image like this and turn it into something more, more useful. So I suppose my passion is in this particular disease called glioblastoma, and it's the link between these very gifted people, George Gershwin, the famous concert pianist, Robert Moog, so if you're, if you're into your electronic music, he was the inventor of the modern electronic synthesizer, Teddy Kennedy, who died recently, and Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein, we believe died of a glioblastoma. It's a terrible disease because it's responsible for more years of life loss than any other common adult cancer. What that means is that it strikes earlier in life, where most cancers tend to occur later in life, and it's almost invariably fatal, so that once you get it, uh, your prognosis is not good. And the problem about it is that, as a tumor, it's very heterogeneous. Uh, different parts of the tumor look very, very different. And we can see here, this is a microscope slide looking at the tumor at fairly low power, and you get the sense that the architecture of the tumor here is very different to the architecture of the tumor here. And what that means is that we can see very different behavior in different parts of the brain where the tumor is spreading. And the trouble about glioblastoma is that it uses the connections between different parts of the brain to actually travel. And this particular patient had a tumor starting in this side of the brain, and it's used the cabling that joins the left and right hemispheres of the brain, which are effectively parallel uh, uh, processing units, uh, it's used that bridge to actually get over to the other side of the brain. And the consequences for this particular patient are very severe. It results in loss of personality. It robs that patient from their family uh, of, of who they actually are. So I spend my time focusing on trying to treat this tu tumor. And what we know is that if we actually look at the tumor cells and take them out and put them into a dish, and if we give increasing doses of radiation and look at how many of the tumor cells survive, if we give either radiation on its own or radiation in combination with drugs, we can actually kill most of these cells. But if we then look at this curve, which is the survival of real patients, and what we see here is time in days since they were diagnosed with the illness, and this is the proportion of patients who remain alive, most of the patients, unfortunately, half of them are surviving about a year. You can see it's only a small group of patients, around about 8%, that will actually survive out beyond three to five years. And the problem is, is that although we can do this in a Petri dish, we just can't give enough radiation to kill the tumor without killing the patient. The collateral damage from radiation therapy is just too high. And so that got me thinking, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could tell what type of tumor you had, whether you had a stay-at-home tumor or a traveling tumor. Because from experience, we kind of get the feeling that different patients behave in different ways. So a stay-at-home tumor is a tumor that tends to just grow in one place. Often stay-at-home tumors grow very, very fast indeed, but they will just grow in one place. Whereas a traveling tumor like this starts from one place and spreads out into different areas of the brain. And if we had a way of knowing whether you were going to have a stay-at-home tumor or a traveling tumor, we might think about different ways of treating it. Because here, if the tumor stays in one place, I can up the radiation dose quite safely to that area. Whereas here, where the tumor is traveling, we might think we need to use something else, something that's going to go all the way through the body and the brain and attack the tumor cells wherever it may go. And this was where, as it happens, just like last night, 
I was at a very nice dinner at a, at a college, it was actually at Christ College, where I sat next to a consultant radiologist and we got talking about what we did. And he showed me an image like this, which really changed my life. I'd never seen an image like this before. This image, which we now see in color, is what's called a diffusion tensor image. And what it does is to actually use an MRI scanner to map out the big pathways, the cabling that join different parts of the brain. That's why it doesn't look like a normal brain scan. But actually, if you look, compare it with a cross section of the brain taken at post-mortem, you can see how beautifully the image reproduces all of the cabling that joins the different parts of the brain together. Uh, the color basically is by taking the image and encoding the direction so that we see um, cables that tend to run from front to back are blue, um, the cables that tend to r run across are red, and cables that run in and out of the plane of the image are, are in green. Sorry, the green and the blue, I've got the wrong way around. So the green is running back to front and the blue is running in and out um, perpendicular to the image. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. I, I'm, to actually be able to see inside a patient's brain and image the connectivity of the different parts of the brain without having to actually cut the head open, that's pretty, pretty fantastic. And so then we got thinking, okay, well, you know, maybe we could use this for something else. It was originally developed to look at stroke, but we thought, well, maybe we could use it to look at how tumors spread through the brain. And this was our thinking. Um, we know that the image that was created is produced by imaging how water spreads through the brain. And water spreads through the brain following channels that actually exist. So, and it's a bit like the principle of a thatched roof on a house. So a thatched roof keeps the house warm and dry. And you say, well, why is that? All you've got is a whole set of reeds of the thatch actually lied on, lying on top of each other. And the reason is, is that when water falls on top of the thatch, there's a natural direction that the water is channeled that takes the water off the roof and to drop down onto the side. And that's exactly the same as the images that we were seeing on the diffusion tensor scan. What we were seeing is that we see these fibers, this cabling that joins different parts of the brain together, and water simply flows along these cables. So we said, well, maybe if a cable has got a bit of tumor in it, maybe the water doesn't flow in the right way. Maybe we can see something about the way that the water flows. And we imaged one of our first patients here that had had a tumor removed from this part of the brain. And everything looked really normal on their in initial imaging. You can see everything looks pretty clear um, at this point. And we did the diffusion tensor image. And what we saw, basically, was that in this part of the cabling moving from one side of the brain to the other, there were little holes in the cable where the water was not diffusing in the normal pattern that it did. And sure enough, when we imaged the patient later, we saw that the tumor had come back and it had come back in exactly the place that had been predicted by the diffusion tensor image. Um, so we thought, right, we might be onto something here. The difficulty was that the actual dealing with the image data was quite difficult. The, the water diffusion tensor um, isn't just a standard grayscale map. We had six scalars to deal with for each voxel. So we had a difficulty of how to get that data into our systems for planning radiotherapy treatment. And so that became my um, uh, project, effectively, was working out how to do that. At the time, we worked with an engineer, and he said, oh, well, we're familiar with this type of problem of dealing with uh, tensor uh, image data. And he introduced us to a technique, principal component analysis, that allowed us to try and analyze this data in uh, more subtle ways to pick up these changes in patients that didn't have such dramatic changes. And so that what we were able to do was to then start building areas around the tumor that we could see that might represent areas of microscopic disease that were at risk of the tumor spreading into them. And I looked at that and I thought, now I can use that because I can use that as a target for radiation therapy. Now, before we proceeded with doing this, before we actually changed what we did to a patient, we had to know that our hypothesis was true. And I worked with a colleague, Stephen Price, who's a, a neurosurgeon who's also interested in imaging. And he did a very important study. What he did was to take parts of the brain that we could see on this new image uh, that looked as if they might be abnormal and actually take a little needle biopsy and find out what that area looked like. And what we found, basically, was that our technique was extremely good at picking out tumor beyond that that you could see on a normal scan. 
and we had very, very good sensitivity and specificity of our technique. So this was our light bulb moment. We knew now that we had something that we could actually use to change therapy. And this is when I created my first study uh, where I started using this information to actually change the way that we treated patients. So when I planned this patient's radiotherapy, normally I'd have treated the area of the brain where the tumor was and added a little bit of margin. But now what we're doing is encompassing the area where the tumor, where it looked as if there was a higher risk that the tumor may spread in that way. And because in the past we did the radiotherapy blind, we used to take the area where the tumor sat and add a generous margin for the fact that the tumor may spread into surrounding brain. Because we had no idea where it might go, so we had to cover all possible avenues of spread. That meant that we treated a large area of the brain, and if you remember earlier, the problem with radiation therapy is that the toxicity of the treatment to the healthy brain limits how much we can give. So what I was able to do is to say, well, we don't need to do that because our imaging is telling us that this is the area that we're really worried about. The tumor is unlikely to spread this way, so let's just treat this bit. And because I was treating a smaller area of brain, I could up the dose safely. And eventually that moved forward into an actual clinical trial of using this technique where we looked at the information from the image and we used it to increase the dose uh, in patients where we could safely. And now we're starting to see interesting things. This was the survival curve for patients treated in the normal way. And this is the survival curve for patients actually treated using this optimization so that you can see that in the long term, patients actually had better survival by using this information. Not a dramatic change as we would have liked, as I would have liked, but still moving in the right direction. But what the technique was really, really good at was actually working out when, I, when you first sat down with the patient in front of you, how they might do. And if you look at whether patients had stay-at-home tumors, medium tumors, or very, very spreading tumors, you can see that the survival, the shape of the survival was very different, basically, depending on uh, how we categorize their tumor using the image. So whilst we weren't necessarily able to use the imaging to really change the patient's treatment uh, 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 as much as we'd have liked in terms of improving uh, survival, what we were able to do is to use the image to actually predict how the patient might do. And that's very helpful in terms of thinking about how you're going to treat the patient subsequently after they've had their radiation therapy. So it used to take ages to do all of this. Everything was, had to be done by hand, manually. It used to take me a week to actually do all of, all of the processing in order to get one patient scans all the way through to a radiotherapy treatment. But that's one of the nice things of working with physics-based technologies is that things accelerate. And by 2007, most hospitals actually had scanners that could actually do this type of imaging just by pressing a button. Um, and the workflow got a lot quicker, and it got to the point where it only took me about an hour to actually do all of these calculations. And then I thought, well, it's time to start doing something interesting with this. And if you remember, I said, I strongly believe that you can use models to encode your knowledge. So I thought I should build a model. And that's what I did. I started out building a very, very simple reaction diffusion-based model. And what that did was to actually look at modeling the flow of water through the brain and look and see whether if you could take individual tumor cells and allow them to spread in a way that mirrored the way that water might spread through the brain, you could calculate thousands and thousands of different trajectories for how the tumor might spread from where it was. And if you put all of that information together and sum over thousands and thousands of trajectories, you end up with something like this, a, a heat map or a probabilistic map to say how likely it is to see tumors spreading to different parts of the brain, you see. And this for me was fascinating because the substrate for this model is a real patient scan, yeah? So we're taking our knowledge about what we know about how water spreads through that patient's brain, making an inference about how tumor might spread through the patient's brain, and generating some simulations of tumor spread in a real patient. Really, really nice stuff, but just took me an awful long time to do that kind of thing. Now, Henry Ford, I suppose, is credited with making the motor car commercially viable. And at the time, he was supposed to have said this. If I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. 
people were not ready for the paradigm shift of understanding what an internal combustion engine could do and having a motorized vehicle at the time. And I guess we're kind of sitting on that precipice, really, that we have very sophisticated imaging that we can do. We can image patients in lots of different ways. But effectively, at the moment, we're just building faster horses. Yeah? Scanners get faster and faster, more and more precise. The spatial resolution of our imaging is increasing. But I'm interested in building the motor car. I love playing Forza. Any of the guys who work here would know I'm a complete Forza nut. And um, so, you know, that's what I want to do, is I, I want to build a motor car. And the problem with this is that we can make the models, we can make our biological models and understand, encode what we know about biology. But we need to put in an awful lot of initial conditions into these models if we're going to deal with, you know, produce interesting hypotheses. And we need to get image data at lots of different levels. We might need microscopy data looking at how the tumor actually looks like uh, in high power under the microscope. We might need to use additional information from other techniques uh, where we stain the material and get extra information. We might need to drill down to the underlying DNA, the gene expression of the tumor. And we need to be able to do this for lots and lots of patients, and we need to be able to do it fast so that we can actually take the data and put it into a model and start making inferences quickly, perhaps whilst the patient's actually sat with us. And we kind of know this is a big data problem. Big data is this trendy phase, particularly at the moment in universities, because everyone thinks that we should be doing it. And I suppose the real delight for me is being able to take baby steps along that process with some of the people that I've collaborated with here. Um, and I'm just going to show you very briefly some of the things that, that we have done in terms of accelerating the way in which we process that. The first thing that I wanted to do was to be able to actually look at different areas of the tuber in hundreds of scans and use that information about how far the tumor had spread, what the different characteristics of the tumor was, because remember I said that it looks very different from one part of the brain to the other. And if, I, if I've got a data set of, let's say, 350 patients, I wanted to be able to process every single patient's scan every, at every point in time and take all of that data. And the problem with that is actually it just takes a long time to actually mark out the areas of the tumor. And so with Antonio Criminisi, we first developed this machine learning algorithm that could do exactly that. Um, and uh, as a result of developing that algorithm, actually, we submitted it to one of the challenges at Mackay. And because we had such good data going into it, and we worked really hard on annotating the clinical image data that we put in, we were able to train our model very well. And it actually won the, the challenge in, uh, in, that, in that particular year. But it means that we have a tool that can actually do this kind of segmentation of a brain tumor, which is a difficult thing to do automatically. There are lots of algorithms that will segment normal human anatomy. In other words, structures that the computer is likely to expect. It knows to look for two kidneys, a heart, a liver. But it doesn't know anything about uh, a brain tumor sitting in the normal brain. Well, let me just comment. I think you will have seen a, a demo about this yesterday. Uh, that flies towards them. So, for me, that, that's amazing. Also, as on a practical note, this is what I have to do every day for radiotherapy. I have to mark out the areas that we're going to treat. And for a brain tumor patient, it normally takes about an hour. And the first time I got GEOS, which is the manual segmentation tool that we use to develop the machine learning algorithm, and I saw that I could do it in seconds, I nearly wept. I mean, it was just to see that kind of workflow acceleration is just tremendous. So moving from this length scale of the patient at the scan down to the individual tumor and how it actually forms. Uh, I've done work with Jasmine Fisher and using the, her experience from systems biology and particularly using the sort of exe executable biology type um, code that she has in F-sharp to develop this. And this is basically a virtual Petri dish. It's a tumor growing out um, in a Petri dish. And as the tumor gets larger, we see real processes happening. We see the center of the tumor dying for lack of nutrients, and, uh, uh, um, and we see the tumor proliferating around the edge. We're able to populate this tumor with certain tumor stem cells. These are thought to be the cells that can actually produce all of the elements of the tumor. And for me, the really interesting thing is having got the, mo the model to behave in a reasonably realistic way is that we can perturb it. We can give doses of radiation and watch what happens to the tumor as the tumor cells die and then recover again and die and recover again. 
And for me, this is very, very nice because we have a wealth of information about this type of thing in what's called radiation biology going back 40, 50 years. So to actually be able to tune our model to that observed data means that we can then start doing interesting things and start asking interesting questions of that model. One of the things that I've been doing recently with Darko Zicchi is looking at the um, pathology specimens that we get from patients with brain tumors. And we get hundreds and hundreds of slides. We, we have about, we see about 500 patients with glioblastoma every year in our center. Um, and one of the things that we want to do, because we're always interested in the fact that the tumor looks very different from one part to the other, is just to see how fast it's growing in one part of the tumor compared to the other. And we have these staining techniques that basically label a cell that is growing, again, which is the brown cells, against the blue cells, which are the ones that are just resting, sleeping. And we know very clearly that the more cells that are actually growing at a point in time, the worse the outcome for the patient. And we use that information clinically. For our, for our colleagues in neuropathology, they basically sit there in a darkened room with a considerable number of cups of coffee, I should think, with a clicker. And they basically have to go through as many of these slides as they can and click each time they see a normal cell and click each time they see a cell that's dividing. And then we get that information that's discussed. And, we ha and they have to do that for every single patient that we see and we make a plan for in our, in our <coughs> meeting. And the thing about this is that Darko has just recently implemented and for what was him, he described as rather a simple machine learning application. He said it wasn't hard to do, but actually it was able to annotate every single cell in this slide in about two seconds. You know, and when you think about it from the pathologist's point of view, that's just amazing. You know. And it may be, perhaps looking forwards for you in your PhDs, that you will go on and develop very nice esoteric concepts as the outputs of your thesis that get you, get you through. Um, but sometimes, actually, it's, it's kind of the more noddy, simple ends of the application that, 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 uh, of your work that actually have the greatest impact. Um, and that might be an example of that. Um, last summer, we were very fortunate to have Dalia, Daniel Alexander visiting, uh, who's a, 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 an imaging scientist from UCL. It's UCL. Um, and I was talking to him about my interest in DTI. And uh, he said... You did all this amazing stuff about how DTI can um, show you um, how the tumor is actually spreading when a patient first presents with a brain tumor. You then did all this radiation therapy, and you then didn't do any more DTI. Why? And I said, well, I did try, but the problem is, is that once I give the radiotherapy, radiotherapy in any part of the body causes swelling. Swelling is just water edema, too much water in the tissue that shouldn't be there. And of course, because DTI, in my understanding, was a water-based signal, it was trying to visualize how water flows, I had basically just disrupted all of my signal by the radiotherapy. And so the images that I had in my patients, they didn't really make any sense. We couldn't get any useful data out of them. And then he introduced me to this technique, which is effectively, it's a, it's a computational model of the micro, microstructure of the brain and it tackles the problem in reverse by identifying the underlying microstructure of the normal brain that you expect, and then taking the information that you get from the image and then layering it onto that rather than the other way around. And the nice thing about it is that it allows you to see structural changes in the brain that might be the effect of the actual treatment itself and separate them from, um, uh, uh, sorry, it's structural changes in the brain that might be caused by the tumor and separate them from the swelling and the changes that we cause from the treatment. So that's a really exciting possibility that we have, um, again, kind of coming out of all of this. So moving forwards, what do I really want? What I want, effectively, is like a flight simulator, in the sense that we know that pilots that are going to take us to our various destinations after the meeting um, are, are able to do that safely because they log up hundreds of hours running simulation scenarios on equipment that allows them to suspend their disbelief and believe they're doing the job for real. And I don't want a flight simulator. I want what's been termed an onco simulator, where I'm able to take information about the patient's tumor and anatomy at the microscopic scale and the macroscopic scale and start to make simulations of possible treatment outcomes for that particular patient. 
And for me, that's the driver for doing all of this quantitative imaging. You know, in healthcare, we are generating terabytes of information data at the moment, and it's largely being processed, analyzed, um, annotated, and thrown away. And I think that being able to do something like this would be tremendous. And I think for me, this is one of the things that I, I find kind of slightly saddening, is that image processing in and of itself is potentially a disruptive technology. Disruptive, I mean, in the sense that it changes the way that we think about a process or procedures relating to a process. And some of those applications have quite significant demands on, in, on information governance, personal security. But if you look at this, you know, we've got different applications, fingerprint scanners, iris recognition at the airport, um, automatic number plate recognition. Even in your camera, if you've got a modern camera, you have automatic face detection to help with focusing. Of course, the Kinect system, which was developed here, and even things like Oculus VR, which is now being rolled out into a lot of applications beyond gaming. Um, these all rely, basically, on image processing. And what's nice is that we kind of accept that on a society level, that some of these things are really quite intrusive on our privacy, like ANPR, like um, you know, fingerprint and iris detection. But we accept them because there is a greater good for personal security. If you're traveling on an airplane, it's quite reassuring to have the biometrics to know that the people on the plane are likely to be the people that they think are on the plane. And so we accept it. But somehow in healthcare, that hasn't happened. And the idea of actually going on and using image processing from patient scans hasn't really made that transition. And to me, that seems a real shame. One of the things I actually did uh, last year was to create a, a database where patients could actually voluntarily donate their images. So we would go to patients and say, you've had treatment for a cancer, and would you mind donating all of the images that are actually created as a result of your treatment and follow-up? And once or twice when I talk to patients about this, they get cross. And they say, I didn't sit there on your scanner being uncomfortable for an hour for you to then throw away all the data. I thought you were doing this anyway. And when I explain that information governance as it stands means that I can't do that. I, I can't take that data and use it in this way without explicit permission or without creating uh, a, a research study. You know, they feel very saddened. And I think that a lot of the very brightest people in image processing domains across the board tend to shy away from looking at medical applications. Why? Because they have a good idea. They think, I could try this. And they then have to spend six months getting hold of the, all of the permissions to actually get some data, to actually do some analysis. And for many people, they just think, you know what, I, I can't be bothered. It's just too much hard work. And for me, that's a real shame, because I want the people that have developed Oculus VR and the people that developed Connect to actually come and help us with the real problems that we face. Because at the end of the day, it's only people's lives at stake. So it's a slightly glib comment, but just something to leave you with to kind of think about. So I'd like to finish just by acknowledging all the thanks, all of the people that I've had as collaborators. And what's delightful is you can see that the list from my own institution is nearly as long as the list from Microsoft Research. Uh, and together with some other, uh, other collaborators that I've had. So I'll stop now. Uh, thanks for listening, and I'm quite happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Raj. I've uh, seen Raj talk now uh, several times in this or similar form, and I'm still absolutely fascinated by it, and I'm sure you, you, you feel the same. Um, so we have uh, some time for questions now. Actually, we've made, made up uh, some, some good time because we've got quite an agenda ahead of us, but we do have about 10 minutes for questions. So um, any questions from the audience? Of your segmentation, you were mentioning some data of 98% sensitivity or so. But uh, if you take, if I understood it right, you take one biopsy from the brain to do that, but it's hard for me then to see how can you say about this validation because if you're predicting the edge of the tumor, I assume that you then really have to take multiple samples yes. along the edge to be able to do any uh, uh, calculations of accuracy. So, how does that actually work? Yeah, no, spot on. So the way that it works basically is we had to work out a way of doing the validation without putting the patient at extra risk. And what we did was that we, the patients had to have a biopsy to find out what their tumor was. That's the underlying reason. 
but the process meant that a needle had to go all the way through some normal brain in order to get to the, the tumour and find a biopsy. And what we got permission to do from ethics was instead of just going in, taking that biopsy and coming out, was that once having made that path, we then took multiple biopsies. So we moved from what we knew to be tumour to what we knew to be normal tissue. And so for each patient, we had, I think it was between 12 and 18 biopsies taken along that path. So you're right, it's not a, it's not a, a, a single um, biopsy that says, you know, the biopsy says this, the scan says this. And doing multiple biopsies for the patient, it's not, I mean, brain head doesn't have, so he does not feel pain, but is it of no discomfort? No, well, actually, there are no pain receptors in the brain. Um, the pain receptors are on the lining of the brain and on the skull. Yeah, and so actually when you get a, when you get a headache from uh, things happening within the brain, it's actually coming from this, the lining of the brain, not the brain itself. Is it also the usual uh, practice to take multiple uh, biopsies in the case of a brain tumor? Um, you wouldn't normally, unless there was some reason that you were interested that perhaps two parts of the tumor looked very different. But I think the key thing that we were able to say, for, we had to get ethical clearance to do this, basically. And the key thing is that the risk to taking multiple biopsies on one path is the same as the risk of taking one biopsy on one path. And that's why they said that we could do it, that we were, we were lucky from that point of view. Other questions for Reich? No? Yeah. yeah. Hi, thanks for the brilliant talk. Um, you were, yeah, well, you're mentioning sort of all your collaborations here. Um, and a few slides earlier, you mentioned that uh, one of sort of the most significant contributions was to sort of speed up the workflow through what seemed from Microsoft research perspective a really simple thing. So my question is um, sort of how difficult it is it to do these types of collaborations where um, yeah, you might end up getting sort of a vastly improved workflow, but Microsoft that doesn't really push sort of the frontiers of computer science research. And the same thing that, yeah, something that might sort of push computer science research might actually not have that big of an outcome for patients or might never get past sort of IRBs. So yeah. if you could sort of comment on the tension there. Um, no, I, I think that's a very perceptive question. There has to be a quid pro quo in that there is something interesting from both sides. And um, what normally happens is that we have a discussion around a particular problem and we look at the data. Um, and there have been times where, you know, we, we just kind of kicked something out because we realized, well, it's not going to be of sufficient interest, you know, to, to, to actually develop. But what we've been fortunate on is that generally in a particular problem, there might be a cardinal goal developing the new algorithm, proving you know, best-in-class type um, output, and there might be some low-hanging fruit that we get along the way. And generally, that's been the way that we've kind of looked at this. Um, so, so Darko's code actually was originally developed for segmenting breast cancer cells for a particular global challenge. And so when we looked at that together and we were having some issues you know, talking about that particular uh, thing, and then I said, well, why don't we try it for, for brain tumor cells? And so often that's the, 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 the way that things work out. And, and it's now nice that we have a sufficiently close collaboration um, that we can actually do that, you know, that we understand each other's you know, needs and desires to actually say, okay, well, yeah, you know, that's, that's uh, a very much an implementation step, uh, but we want an innovation step to go, you know, to, to keep this project going sort of thing. So, yeah, I mean, we've, you know, we've been lucky in that way, I guess. But I also know, for example, the researchers here in the um, machine learning group who've worked on the, on the GLIOS tool. So I've, had, I've heard feedback that the uh, application to medical images actually then improved, for example, the work on Kinect. So it's a really uh, important application domain that does advance other parts of machine learning too. So there was a one um, perhaps easy example that Darko had, but I think there, there were many, many studies in the past where really the, the medical images advanced uh, our research greatly. Um, any other questions for us? Yeah. One more. Uh, regarding the difference between the in house tumor and this traveling tumor. Uh, so, um, in your recent, I mean, the likelihood that it will be a traveling tumor, does it, it does not only depend on how close it is to the water channels, but also probably on the specifics of the tumor itself, like which genes were uh, mutated, etc. So, can you give any insight of the 
like of these factors, which one is the more important for the to decide whether it is a this traveling tumor or not? Like, is it just its location mostly, or is it in fact the specifics of the genetics of the tumor? Uh, it, it is pretty much a balance of the two. It is, the, you know, I mean, you can have a you can have a traveling tumor by genotype, uh, which phenotypically sits in a poorly connected part of the brain, um, and it will behave like a stay-at-home tumor. So it's you really have to understand the two, and that's one of the nice things now is that you know with with tissue microarray we we can start building up profiles um, of what are the genetic um, fingerprints, if you like that go with the traveling type of tumor, uh, and then try and correlate that you know, with what we have on the, on the imaging side of things. But you, you're right, you, you need both bits of that information, really, to be able to kind of you know, populate a model if you're going to try and predict this. And your take is that both of these factors are just as important, like the location and the genetical. That's story. right, that's right. And I think what's really fascinating is that we can't change the structure of the brain or the connectivity where the tumor arises. But if we can identify a patient where the connectivity is of a concern and the expression of the tumor is one that is going to travel, there are now potentially some drug therapies that what they do is that they don't stop the tumor from growing. Uh, but what they do do is to stop them from traveling. Effectively, they, they kind of rub their shoes. They stop them from expressing the adhesion molecules that allow them to spread and move along the white matter tracts. And so it's doing things like that where we can actually start to be much more specific in terms of thinking from what we know from our model of this patient, we can change the way that we do the therapy so that we might, for example, give them um, uh, you know, an infiltration inhibitor first, treat them with that, and then once we've got all of the corraled, all of the tumor cells in one place, then I come in and do the radiation therapy. So, yeah. It's a, it's, 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 a, it's a biological agent, basically, yeah. I mean, but it, it's targeting that specific process. Yeah. Right, okay, so one more question, if there's any, otherwise we'll close this session, move on to the next. No, let's thank uh, Rush again. Thank you.